Viet Thanh Nguyen was the American Library in Paris's first writer in residence. And so this evening, Tan Wen returns to the library, albeit virtually from California, where it's 10.30 a.m. <laughs> to present his new novel, The Committed, to a French audience for the first time. The Committed is Tan Wen's long-awaited sequel to his New York Times best-selling and Pulitzer Prize-winning debut novel, The Sympathizer. Tan Wen will be in conversation with Pauline Le Masson, who, after working at the American Library in Paris as strategic partnerships manager, now writes for Anse Barrel and Untapped Paris. And Viet will also be in conversation with Grace Lee, a French author, blogger, and producer. Through her writing, podcasts, and video series, Lee, who was recently profiled in a special edition of Mary Claire magazine, is a key figure in the fight against racial discrimination and stereotypes in France today. Viet, Pauline, and Grace, thank you so much for joining us virtually at the library this evening. Hi everybody. Sorry, I was like looking through all the you know the the images and seeing friends and people I haven't seen in a long time. So just trying to say hi. If I didn't if I didn't catch you, I'm sorry. But it's it's great to be back to be back here, uh, even virtually. And you know, really fantastic to be in conversation with with Grace and uh, and with Pauline, um, who I've, I've met and talked to before. Uh, and uh, you know, especially interested in hearing sort of the first. French reaction, although I guess this is more of a French American or French Anglo American reaction. Uh, we'll see how the French themselves re react to the book in French when it comes out in the fall. Thanks for having me. Are we? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening to you all. Uh, a really warm welcome to uh, Viet. Uh, we're so thrilled to have you. I'm also really thrilled to be joined uh, by Grace Lee, our co-interviewer tonight. Um, I think I speak for everyone here, Viet, that we really, really wish you were with us in Paris um, and you know, better circumstances, you know, perhaps in the very near future, we will have that opportunity again. Um, I want to actually take you back to when you first started doing research for this. Um, I believe you spent a couple of summers uh, in Paris uh, with the wonderful task of doing research here. Um, the last time you were in Paris actually was in 2018. You are our first uh, writer in residence at the American Library in Paris. It was such a privilege to have you there. Um, before that, I don't know how long your relationship with France goes, um, but I wanted to ask you um, about the research that you did here and how you came about thinking of how you were going to write about France and the French from an American outsider perspective. I know you wanted to continue this amazing story from The Sympathizer and uh, if that, what part of France did you already know you were going to write about? And did some of that change from the people that you talked to? How did that research come to come to pass? Well, my relationship with France started uh, through colonization, I guess. Um, my father, actually, who's 86, 87 years old, reminds me of this periodically because, you know, every I, I, whenever I see him, almost inevitably over dinner, he will sing various songs, you know, he, he, he will sing mostly Vietnamese Catholic songs, but every once in a while he'll throw in these French songs that he learned in his youth in the 1930s and 1940s when, you know, he was living in North Vietnam, Vietnam and, and obviously France, uh, Vietnam, was still, Vietnam was still under French colonization. So he remembers that. And of course, I've been mentally colonized by the French <laughs> for better and for worse. I, I find myself e easily susceptible to anything involving the French language, French food, French culture, French movies, and all of that. Um, in fact, I, the last TV that I've seen, and I've seen very little over the last couple of years or so, uh, was Lupin, the, the French series. And now I'm going to try to read it in French. So I've been mentally colonized by the French. I love French culture, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, when you're colonized, I, and as I try to point out in the novel, it is a love-hate relationship. And the French have a lot of love-hate relationships with other cultures. I think they should totally understand this ambivalence on my part. Um, and my first visit to France was actually as a backpacker in 1998 for six uh, for, for a couple a week or two, and went to Paris for six days, absolutely loved it. And then my wife and I had our honeymoon in Paris for seven months. So we were really, really lucky 
in 2003 to get the chance to spend seven months. And the where we lived was actually in the 11th, and we lived in the apart in the in the building that the French aunt lives in. So that's the one thing I wanted to shout out in the book was we were living on uh, Rue Richard Lenoir, not Boulevard Richard Lenoir, but the, but the Rue, and on the, on, I think it was number 37, so I mentioned that in the, um, in the book. So we were there, and it was a wonderful time. You know, we had an apartment, and we deliberately picked the 11th because we didn't want to be in the completely touristed areas of Paris. In fact, back then in the 11th, there were, there were very few tourists and Americans in that particular area. I think that's changed by now. Um, but we felt like we were getting more of the, the uh, Parisian experience there and it was very romantic, very romantic. And we got this idea in our heads that maybe we'd want to spend more time in Paris eventually. And that did work out. We went back a few times. And then when it came time to writing the sequel to The Sympathizer, I felt that the, the Sympathizer, our narrator, had to go to Paris I think for um, for American readers, when they finish the sympathizer and you know he's fleeing the country, Viet Vietnam again, a lot of Americans thought he must be going back to the United States because that's what you do when you flee communism. You must go to the land of the Happy Meal, McDonald's, the American dream, all of this. But in my mind, that was never the case. Um, I mean, these books are supposed to be a critique of capitalism and democracy and Western liberalism, or at least one part of these books do that. And so he had to go to France because that was the land of his father, the, the French priest. And I felt that my safest, safest bet in writing this novel was to write this novel in Paris as the novel of an outsider. So the novel makes no claims to having an insider's knowledge of Paris or France. Uh, so he's an outsider, he's looking at things from the outside and as someone who's mentally colonized. So he knows some things about French culture, but he's never actually been to France itself. Um, and I deliberately made him rusty in French so that there could be some comic potential there. And also that, I, again, he would have a, a learning curve about what he, what he discovers about France. So the research that I did, I try to read as much of, you know, interesting contemporary French literature as I, as I could. Um, and, uh, and try to talk to as many French people of Vietnamese descent as I could as well. So what I told them was I wanted to write a gangster novel set in the Vietnamese world of Paris. And their reaction, I think almost uniformly was, there are no Vietnamese gangsters in Paris. And I was like, what? Because in the United States, there are a lot of Vietnamese gangsters. I grew up <laughs> terrified of Vietnamese gangsters. So I have no idea. I, I literally, to this day, I have no idea what happened to produce a completely different Vietnamese community in France versus the United States. I refuse to believe that the, the French people of Vietnamese descent are so good and pure hearted that they don't do these kinds of things. And in fact, I did get a little bit close. Uh, I think Anna Moy told me, um, the author told me, oh yeah, you know, I did know some dude who was doing LSD and he was like a, a Vietnamese rocker, rock <laughs> musician, you know, and that was it. That was the closest I could get. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make these gangsters. So our sympathizer comes to Paris He's been deeply traumatized by the events of the sympathizer and he, he makes some bad choices. He becomes a capitalist in, in, in Paris, which is to say he becomes a drug dealer. And he, works, and he works for a crime boss who I call the boss. And I said, okay, I'm gonna make the boss ethnic Chinese from Vietnam. And I think the, the French and Vietnamese descent were like, yeah, the, French, the Chinese would do this kind of thing. And from what I can tell about French stereotypes of Asians, there seems to be a distinction between how the French see those of Chinese descent versus Vietnamese descent and the ones of Chinese descent get the, get the bad stereotypes and the Vietnamese get the good stereotypes. So I had a lot of conversations with the French of Vietnamese descent and I, and I have to say it was very illuminating because I realized that we are very different. That is, I grew up very differently than the French of Vietnamese descent. They have a very different attitude about um, some of the central questions in the book around race, colonialism, and uh, identity. I think basically from, if I understand this correctly, <laughs> the French of Vietnamese descent really do believe, it seems, in the French ideals of uh, equality, democracy, universalism, and they feel very um, assimilated or very French. I don't know what the term would be. Um, they feel very French, I think. And and on the other hand, I'm an American and I, and, I, and, I, and I feel that, you know, I come with an American set of preoccupations and hangups about the importance of race and other identities and how they work. And um, 
you know, the thing that was striking for me in my conversations with the French of Vietnamese descent is that no one, uh, one person, one person mentioned that racism existed uh, for other people in France. But everybody else, all the other French of Vietnamese descent I talked to never brought it up. And from my American point of view, my American analysis is that race is always relational. So mm -hmm. perhaps the French of Vietnamese descent are well liked in Paris or in, in Paris, I think, um, because they're not, besides, besides what they are and what they do, they're also not Arab or Algerian or black and so on. The, the French of Vietnamese descent who did not come from Paris, you know, they came from other provinces and so on, did say, well, yes, in my village or whatever, people did say things, they did, they did, do, they did do the chinky eye slant and they did make jokes, but that was just being stupid. That's not really racism. Um, mm. From an American perspective, that's racism, but from the French perspective, that's not racism. So the novel tries to deal with the, these, um, these distinctions. You know, I think, I think it's important to acknowledge how the French and Vietnamese feel about things and the French perspective on, on these kinds of issues. And I think the novel does bring this up as a series of conflicts and debates. But at the same time, I think it's also crucial to, to look at society from the outside. And in 2017 and 2018, when I was in Paris last doing this kind of stuff, what was happening in, in France now was obviously already still happening, obviously. It's been going on for a while, but it, was, it hadn't reached the, the crescendo that it seems to be reaching now in France around these kinds of issues. Um, you had some issues happening around the World Cup and the French football team and so on. And Trevor Noah, you know, was talking about, uh, you know, Africans experience racism and, and the French players of African descent were like, no, we're French. Okay, that, was, that stuff was happening. But now it seems like the, the debates in France have reached kind of a, the rising around these issues. And some French people are blaming Americans for our, for our ideas. Um, and so I guess my novel might be one of these uh, American perspectives that uh, might be alien to the French. So that was the basic background for uh, some of the research that was done. Thank you, Viet. I, um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm French. So I heard you say on TV that um, you had offended um, Americans and Vietnamese people with your last book, and you are maybe expecting to offend the French with this one. So I can I can play that part tonight. I can mm. be the offended French person, and uh, I can totally see in what you said the uh, the character of the aunt, the Vietnamese aunt, who um, who asks um, the sympathizer, you know, do you want to be French? And you know, as if it was just you know a question, as it as a, as a matter of uh, of a willingness you want to or you don't want to there's the you know it's 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 individual <laughs> uh will and uh and she will she, she will think that the, the americans are truly racists where when you know uh when her lover the french um a french politician tells her that she is just as beautiful as a geisha she sees no racism in that phrase and i think you have described some you know the 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 French racism in that relationship and in, in this character. And when, when you came, when you were here in 2018, I was at the American Library of Paris. I was in the audience and I asked you from the audience, I asked you a question. I said, uh, have you faced racism um, in France? And we didn't have a lot of time. So you were, you were quite, you know, uh, as usual, very, uh, you know, witty and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, with a short answer. But uh, now, well, I, I, I didn't hope then that I would find all, your, all the answers to my question in this, in this book, the, the Committed. I think we have a lot of uh, your, uh, your thoughts on how, uh, you know, racism in, in France uh, from an, an American point of view. And going back to the start of the book, when, you say, um, when, you're, when the main character, the sympathizer, uh, gets to Paris and he's at the customs, and uh, he says, well, you know, my father is French. My father was French, so maybe I'm French too. And the person at the customs tells him, well, with that name, you're not French. And I totally identify because, you know, people say that to me still in 2021. 20, so um, uh, how important was it that you, right from the beginning, from that scene, you wanted to be sure that the French and, and, and the Vietnamese uh, in France would not get away with, uh, you know, uh, they would not get away with racism in this book. Well, you know, my first trip to uh, Paris and France, I went to Bordeaux too in 1998. I don't remember any racism, but I was, so I was basically in France for, I went to Nice as well. So I was in the tourist part doing the touristy thing, 
maybe 10 days in, Paris, in France altogether, didn't experience any racism from what I can recall. But in seven, the, the next trip when we spent seven months, no, 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 I'm sorry. The next trip we spent um, uh, three months in Paris, 2002, and we lived in, um, well, basically we lived uh, next to the, the Pompidou. And with three months living in an apartment, uh, literally a, bl a block from the Pompidou, I saw plenty of racism then, um, not directed at me, but I could literally look out my window uh, and see things happening. Um, you know, there's an incident in, well, there's, there's various kinds of things that the novel deals with. I mean, I, I, there are a lot, there, I, I just saw, you know, the police, you know, harassing young black men um, in the area. Uh, I guess the police would say for good reason, if, if you know that area. Um, the, there's an incident in the novel where two police officers beat up a homeless man I, I literally saw that happening from my window. Um, so some of the things in the novel are, are taken directly from just what, just being a witness to things in Paris. Um, I've seen people, black people being pulled over by the police for their papers, uh, for example, on the streets. It's done very casually, no one, no one cares. Um, and during the next period of, of time I spent in Paris for the seven months in the honeymoon, uh, in the 11th, there was, you know, there was an old white woman walking down the street and she just looked at me and said, Chinois! <laughs> so I was like, I was, I was clearly not simply saying, hi, you're a Chinese person. No, it was, I think it was clearly a racial insult at that point. And I think in the 11th, of course, there are, there's a significant Asian uh, population um, doing trade and, and things like that. And then some, in some other part of Paris, central Paris, uh, just in the subway, a black woman said to me, Chinois! And I'm pretty sure that was an insult too. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So racism seems to circulate here. It's just random stuff that's happening. In, and then in, in, um, in Aix-en-Provence, uh, just a bunch of kids saying ching chong stuff to me as I, as I walked by. Okay, so I, I have said that I have experienced more direct racism in France than I have in the United States. In other words, in my entire life in the United States, maybe I've maybe I've been called Ching Chong or whatever, you know, a couple of times directly, in mean, you know, in a mean way, uh, as was done in those incidents. So that's pretty remarkable that in seven months in Paris, I was called the same number of things that I was called my entire life in the United States. But as I stress, you know, as I stress, that's not the only way that racism operates. Uh, it's not just the direct insult or the physical assault, but racism, in fact, is an environment. And it works through assumptions, attitudes, and through what I call long distance racism. So in the United States, I mean, I was never physically assaulted, but I think I've been psychologically and culturally assaulted ever since I was, <laughs> ever since I arrived in the United States. And of course, if you are, if you are, I'm, I, honestly, I'm sorry, if you're white, uh, or if you happen to be not Asian, you could be black as well, and, and so on, you may not be conscious of the fact that the, that the culture is racist in a certain way towards a certain group like Asians, because you simply assume that this is normal to, to racially mock people and all that. But growing up in the United States, of course, I was watching American movies about the Vietnam War. I was watching comedies featuring Asian minor characters. And there was a lot of racism in these movies that simply was assumed to be normal. Um, that's long distance racism. That's part of the way by which a culture identifies people and treats them in a racist fashion and distorts their consciousness and the perception of them. And I'm pretty sure it works the same way in France. I'm just going to make a guess that there's a lot of ingrained racist attitudes among the French about Asians and the French of Asian descent that simply becomes normalized, for example, in the idea that you can make jokes about p French people of Asian descent, like their eyes or whatever, and people will say, that's not racism, that's just, that's just people being stupid or whatever. Um, so uh, it, it felt important to me in, in this novel that I'd not write the novel about France as being the, the I don't know, the French of the Eiffel Tower, the France of the Eiffel Tower and the France of the romantic tourist postcards or the France of sort of the, the France of sort of the intellectual human problems that a lot of Americans seem to like and the French too, you know, I like reading French literature, right? But that, that, that writing, writing these kinds of novels in which I either talked about the tourist aspects of France or I talked about the, the sort of the uniformity of French culture that obviously allows for problems but talks about problems in a universal way uh, neither of those were interesting to me in terms of, of what I wanted to do, because from my perspective, and maybe my, my perspective has been totally Americanized, I just could not help but see 
the various kinds of issues that I raise in the novel. And I don't think it's just me. So that's why it was important for me in the novel to cite people. So for example, I cite uh, or quote uh, France Fanon and Aimé Césaire, uh, who spoke fluent French and who lived in France and who know French culture and French people very well. Uh, of course, from the 1940s and 1950s. But what they had to say about French colonialism, French racism, French humanism, and life in, in, in France for, for Black people seemed to me to be still happening today. And just because they weren't talking about Asians doesn't mean that their ideas did not have applicability in the context of the French, coloni French colonization of Asia and the consequences for how the French regarded um, Asian people. And then uh, I also looked at, uh, I guess it's a controversial book, uh, Sex, Class, Economie, Sex, Race, and Colonies. Um, it's a big, 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 big picture book. And picture book does not quite do justice to that book because it's a compendium of the visual imagination and fantasies that the French have had towards their colonies and colonized peoples. Um, it's, it's, it, it includes everything from the, the romantic exotic stuff uh, to the really horrifying racist, violent, sexist <clears throat> images that the French have produced and have had, uh, which of course goes hand in hand with, the, with French colonization uh, in both its, its racist and its sexist uh, versions. And so the novel, tries to dread bring up that that history and of course all of it culminates in this I guess I'll give it away at the end near the end this 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 orgy that takes place in this very chic uh French townhouse or apartment um I think it's on Avenue Osh uh, I went into one of these places so I I've been into some of these fancy lobbies I don't get any further than the lobbies we're like oh my god this is so this that's one of these elite French apartments that it ha that this this orgy happens in and and that scene combines the apartments that I've seen and the story about, you know, DSK, Dominique Strauss-Kahn and his high-end call, call um, prostitution, prostitution circle, right? You know, th that was a real thing, right? Where he and his liberal progressive friends also enjoyed expensive prostitutes. Imagine what if these, these orgies that they were alleged to have participated in also included this Orientalist dimension of fantasy as well. Right. Um, yeah, that that scene uh, happens, I believe it's three quarters into the book. So yeah, it's, it's quite something. Uh, even just reading it is, uh, it's quite, uh, yeah, it's very well done. Um, I wanted to talk about your protagonist, um, and the duality of his his identity. Um, he is the man of two faces, two identities, he sees things from two sides always. Um, and that's something that I, you know, can definitely relate to uh, being a daughter of immigrants. Um, I was the interpreter for my parents starting at the age of seven, going to banks and making very, very difficult financial decisions for my parents, um, navigating between English and Chinese, being American and Chinese. Um, and your protagonist, of course, is um, the man of two faces. He's got the screw that's coming loose. Um, he's an ex-former communist spy. He's a revolutionary without a, a revolution. And I read in a, in a comment of a book club that was reading your book, The Committed, and uh, there was one person that said, you know, this protagonist would be really better off if he just picked a side. Um, and so pick a side and your life would be just so much easier. And I realized that I understand this duality like I'm sure a lot of people do. But then it reminds me that there's quite a few people actually who don't. Uh, they're un uncomfortable with duality. Um, it's either you love it or you hate it. You either leave it or you know you stay or you leave. You're it's black or white. Um, and so, what would you say about this having to pick a side when really the whole premise is is this dual identity? Well, in fact, I think the commenter is probably right. Uh, better off you would be better off picking a side in the sense that you would not face these, these conflicts, uh, mm. personal conflicts, political conflicts. So literally better off in that sense, in the short term for yourself. Um, but of course, the, our, like, as you're saying, some of us can't make that decision. And if we do make that decision to choose a side, are we actually better off in the long run? And that, those are the two issues that the novel 
that these novels bring up that for some people, they're just so uh, divided, not, not, they're so conflicted that it's impossible. And I, of course, I experienced that in a minor way, you know. Um, so, for example, when I became a citizen in the United States, uh, my parents uh, both changed their names from Vietnamese names to, to uh, American first names, um, Joseph and Linda, which was a complete shock to me because my entire life up to that point, I was maybe 11, 12 years old, they'd been telling me, you, that's me, are 100% Vietnamese. And then they get their citizenship and they, they adopt American names. I was very confused at that point. And they said, do you want to change your name? And <laughs> I thought about it because I have a very Vietnamese name. My name is about as Vietnamese as you can get, okay? Um, because Nguyen is the name of something like a quarter of the Vietnamese population. And Viet basically is like the name of the Vietnamese people. So I'm Viet I am like the Vietnamese man, all right? And <clears throat> my parents, when they named me this, must have been thinking we're gonna give our son a very Vietnamese name to tie him literally to the country and the people. So I couldn't change my name. I, it, I mean, I had a choice, but I just could not bring myself to do it um, because I felt tied to, to Vietnam having been born there and uh, being told that I was 100% Vietnamese. So there's some people who just cannot make this decision to choose one side or the other. And then they are blamed for not being able to make that choice. I think part, part of the commenter's uh, implication is that we are at fault, the ones who cannot choose. We are the ones who are the problem. And of course, that's exactly what the committed brings up. The aunt, the French aunt, French Vietnamese aunt tells him, you're the problem. And he says, yes, I'm the problem because I can't choose. But this is, this is in sum what people in the West like to call the cultural conflict or the identity problem being caught between East and West. It's a very basic stereotypical trope, right? And the solution that is typically offered, choose a side, meaning, you know, choose East or West. Or the other option, integrate everything and be a cultural hybrid. So be the best of both worlds, right? In either case, the solution is posed as a cultural solution and a personal solution. You make the personal choice, you integrate or separate your two cultural sides. And in fact, I hope what's clear in these, in these two novels is that it is not a cultural problem and it is not an individual problem. And when, the, when this issue is posed as an individual cultural problem, really what's, what's being posed, what's being done is to put the burden on the person who feels the problem. In fact, it's a political problem. It's a problem of colonization. The real source of these problems is not one's personal angst or one's capacity to blend French and Vietnamese food into this marvelous fusion, the real problem is the fact that one country went into another country and colonized it and then masked the political roots and consequences of this act of exploitation, conquest, appropriation, etc., with a cultural problem. And typically how that happens is that's why we have things like the opera, you know, Madam Butterfly or the musical Miss Saigon. Let's take a political problem of military conquest and economic exploitation and mask it as a cultural problem that can be solved by romance or can be undermined by the personal tragedy of people split between East and West. And so it's very important, I think, that we make that distinction. And that's, that's exactly, I hope, what the novels do. They show our narrator undergoing these intensely personal and cultural problems, but the, the, all the signs point to, as he tells us over and over, the political history of a colonization that the colonizer obviously wants to disavow and the colonized has been encouraged to misunderstand as a personal and cultural problem. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's um, it's uh, very important what you just uh, said about you know how colonization works and how decolonization works. And you mentioned earlier it was a you know it, it implies a love and hate relationship you know within the people who are colonized. And um, you often mention in the book La Mission Civilisatrice, uh, which is the name that the French. Uh, gave to la colonization, colonization, and um, 
and what I like about the committed is that we have the French elite on trial for 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 this uh, you know colonization because we have a politician, we have a, a psych um, psychiatrist, um, psychoanalysis people who are so thanks yeah people who are educated, people who are you know highbrow like the elite of of France and because too often we think oh you know yes it's because they were racist because they were stupid or they were poor or you know they don't know they don't read books I mean you know everyone in this everyone in the committee reads Césaire or Fanon or uh, Hélène Sixou or so um, you know it's um, it's important that the French and I think sometimes we need an outsider point of view and I'm going to make a parallel with um, a scandal that uh, happened here in France uh, uh, two years ago, a year ago, when you know the elite was. Uh, we we needed the New York Times to um, show us that there was a problem with Gabriel Matzneff, who was a, a very famous writer in the you know well, he was famous for writing. Um, uh, pornography with kids and he was you know he sold he was famous for this he, he 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 got prizes for this and everybody thought it was normal I mean all the French people had to go with this and very few people could actually um, you know speak up speak up without be you know exposing themselves and um, you know it, it was 2019 I think uh, a, a New York Times journalist uh, did the investigation and obviously, you know, now and Vanessa Springora, who was one of his uh, victims, she published a book earlier in 2020 and, you know, the whole thing blew up. But, you know, we needed someone outside, an, an outsider to tell us, you know, what this guy is doing is not normal because all the French elite was like, oh, you know, let's give him some money. He's in trouble. Uh, the, the La Mairie de Paris, which is the mayor of Paris, they they actually, you know, some, someone who works for the, La Mairie de Paris, let's be Christophe Gérard, he, um, you know, he was still in, in, in you know, working for Le Mairie de Paris, which is the, you know, the mayor of Paris. So I think it's very important also that the French, you know, uh, have, 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 you know, think about their own racism, that it's not something we import. Every, every time I, I talk about racism, people think, oh, you're importing things from the US, we don't have it here. And yes, we do, you know, we don't import the deaths of the people. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think in the committee, you, 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 you show us how it's difficult to decolonize oneself and one's mind and you know for the French people it's really hard because in 20, 2005 we tried to pass a law here uh, on the benefits of la colonisation. Uh, it, it didn't go through but you know you can you can tell that you know there was a lot of um, of, of pushback but there was also a willingness the French wanted to to to, to uh, you know have a law that said well, what we did there we did we, we went and we did roads and we did schools not to mention that the roads were to, you know, take the goods from from that place to France or that the schools were only to, you know, educate their own kids. But, you know, they, they, they tried to, to, to get away with uh, with this. And I and I think it's really, you know, it's a real fight here to to, um, to um, well, to decolonize its mind. And I think also the choice of words that you um, operate in, in the committed, I think, uh, you know, you. It, from the the prologue, you say you know you know les beaux people. You say les beaux people. You know because that's that's the the the, the name that we give to um, the 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 refugees from Vietnam and ex Indochina who came here. And we use the English word, although we don't like to use English words. We we, we have words like vacances for weekends, or we have um, les mails, m e l for emails because we really want it. You know to have the French word. Nobody uses them. Nobody says je vais. Everybody says I'm going on a weekend, or I'm going to I'm going to send you an email. Nobody uses the French words that l'Académie Française has created, uh, you know, way after uh, the other words were already in use. But anyways, I'm just saying that the, the, it's your choice of words. You know, you choose vessel or arc instead of boat because you know it's important for you because they're heroes and not, um, and you know, not the way that we want to see them. Um, is is this your first step in decolonization? In in decolonize, decolonize Oh, sorry, decolonizing your mind. Yeah, well, I think, you know, uh, decolonization is a big term for me now because uh, I think that is my political project and decolonization involves all kinds of, you know, political and economic kinds of um, and policy issues that need to happen. But the first step in decolonization, as you're saying, is the ideological shift at the level of perception and understanding. 
and even to say the word colonization as a way of understanding where, where we're at, I think is really crucial because the people who are colonizers don't want to say colonization or they want to pretend that it's in the past or they want to dress it up in all the fancy terms that you that you mentioned, civilizing uh, mission. I can't say it as beautifully as you do it in French. As I say in the book, you know, everything sounds better in French, including rape and pillage. Um, this is one of my mental colonization. So yes, it's, it's crucial to say the words colonization and decolonization and then get people to talk about what that means. And oftentimes in the, the way that colonization is masked is through rhetoric and language. Um, as I said earlier, you know, you, you deflect the history of the actual horrifying history of colonization through other kinds of images like romance. And the French have gotten away with it, as far as I can tell. So, you know, in The Sympathizer, one of the things that the novel wrestles with is what the Americans did in Vietnam. And one of the things that the Americans did was they recorded themselves doing terrible things in full color. So to, to a certain extent, the global perception that the American war in Vietnam is a bad war is partly because of the movies, the, the news reporting and the photography that the Americans produced and some other journalists, including French and Japanese, produced out of that war. Now the French, as far as I can tell, did some really terrible things in French Indochina, really terrible things, but that we don't even talk about these things anymore. And partly because the French kind of got lucky, they didn't record their terrible deeds visually. You actually have to go read history books to find out what happened. And so in, instead the visual record we have of French colonization uh, in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia is in black and white photography, uh, usually of sort of just anthropological scenes or of nice colonial scenes of people in white linen suits having a good time. And so the success of that, of that imagery has been, of course, reinforced by the few uh, French movies about their Indo-Chinese experience, movies like uh, Andouchine and The Lover or Le Mans. And uh, that, that gives a very romanticized portrait of what the French period was like in Vietnam. And so then to just even bring up the issue that the French, besides doing like you said, nice things like education <laughs> and whatnot. Oh, you know, we're raping and pillaging. Um, seems really important. And that the way by which colonization also operates besides masking what the colonizer did is to demean the colonized. And so I pick on that term boat people for deliberate reasons because, you know, the, uh, the, op the opening of the committed is, is set on a refugee boat leaving Vietnam, uh, which is where the sympathizer ends. And as Grace said, of course, global attention was brought to the phenomenon of Vietnamese refugees fleeing from Vietnam in the 1970s and 1980s through the use of the term boat people, which was very successful in, in making Western countries feel guilty and getting them to take Vietnamese refugees in, including France. So on the one hand, that's a positive. On the other hand, from, from my perception, the term boat people objectifies Vietnamese refugees as being objects of pity, people who are desperate and frightened and in need of help. Now, of course they were desperate and frightened, but they were also heroic because they, a lot of them knew that their odds of survival were really low that people were dying on these open seas and tens of thousands of people died. We don't know exactly how many, but a lot. And so why shouldn't they be seen as heroic? They're not seen as heroic, obviously, because they're not white and they're refugees. So from my, pers my perspective, it was really crucial in the opening prologue to draw attention to the heroic dimension of anybody who chooses to leave their country and take their lives into their own hands. So I was thinking, of course, of the Vietnamese, but also of everything that's happening today in terms of people choosing to flee you know, over rivers, across mountains, on boats, and so on. And it was ironic, obviously, as you said, it was, it was actually kind of a shock to me to discover that the French pe called these people les beaux people. Like you said, I was like, come on. Like, you know, did you just have to take one of the worst terms in English and use it in French to describe people? And then of course, there's another section in the book where I say, from the American perspective or American history, the pilgrims, and Christopher Columbus were nothing but boat people. But because they are a part of dominant American history, they're portrayed in heroic terms. But if the 
Indians or the native peoples had cameras at the time that the pilgrims arrived on the shores of what they called the New World, what the Indians or natives would depict would be a bunch of really smelly, stinky, ugly, whore, you know, people. They just came on this multi-month journey. They're starving. They haven't had a shower <laughs> in like months. You know, they, they, they look terrible. But of course, we don't have that history. We don't have the history from native perspectives. We have, of course, dominant nostalgia portraying the pilgrims in these oil paintings looking quite, you know, trim with their, you know, <laughs> well-kept. It's a total lie. And so one of the ways that we decolonize is to address the lie that has become the myth. Great, um, I'm gonna jump in now um, to uh, start moderating the chat and the Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much, Pauline and Grace, especially big thanks to you for your fantastic questions and for all your preparation for tonight's event. There was a lot of behind the scenes work that went into these questions. So I really thank you so much for all of your time. Um, okay, I'm just gonna remove your pins. So I just wanted to highlight, Viet, all of these people who are tuning in from truly all over the world. We have Catherine from Westchester, Westchester, Pennsylvania, Margot from Paris, Anne from Paris, Stephanie from California, Kira from Toronto, Augustus from New York, uh, Giacomo from Rome, Suzanne from Norwich, Heather from Napoli, Italy, Audrey from the 7th in Paris, Connie from Montpellier. So you've really attracted a really truly international audience. Um, it's fantastic to see you all here and thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, the first question comes from Peter who writes, and I don't know where Peter's um, coming from, but you're welcome to let us know. He writes, thank you very much for this talk. A question, could you Viet reflect a little on your specific use of the spy slash crime novel genre as a conduit for saying something about politics and contemporary society, in this case, not least colonization. What is it about this genre that may help bring out a clarity or prism if applicable? Sure, no, I mean, the, the first reason for using spy and crime novel genres is because they're fun, at least from my perspective. I, I really love reading spy novels and crime novels. Uh, the second uh, way reason for using them is because in, in the hands of really good writers, uh, you know, for example, John le Carré and, and Graham Greene, the, these genres become uh, vehicles for talking about history and politics. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to talk about spy stories without bringing in history and politics and war and all of that. And of course, for the crime novel genre, um, there's a there the, the one of the reasons it's, it's an important genre is because the good crime writers point out that the individual crime is actually much less important than the systemic crime, right? Uh, so typically, you know, for example, I, I mentioned Lupin. Uh, so if you watch Lupin, you know that you know there's low level crime and high level crime taking place, and the high level crime is the crime of colonization and racism and so on that becomes masked as high society in France. And that's just a very typical move of the crime genre. So in the American context, for example, uh, you know, I think about how in The Committed, he becomes a drug, the narrator becomes a drug dealer. All right. So in the United States, people are very afraid of drug dealers, even if they take drugs themselves. Paradox. <laughs> we, we consume huge amounts of drugs in the United States, but then people are running around, the same people who are like snorting cocaine and smoking pot and so on, they're like, we don't want to hang around Black people because they're dangerous, okay? The real danger in the United States when it comes to drugs is a nice white family called the Sackler family. I mean, they do the opioid business through their pharmacy, pharmaceutical company. They've killed literally tens of thousands of Americans and addicted hundreds of thousands of Americans, but they're the ones who get to put their names on buildings, art museums and things like that because they have billions of dollars and they're a nice white family. They're much more dangerous than your average corner uh, uh, drug dealer who is a poor kid of color. So that's what the crime novel allows a writer to bring up if the writer knows what they're, what they're doing. And so I use these, these genres as vehicles to entertain readers, but then also to make these very deliberate connections between, um, again, the, the lie and the myth. You know, the lie is that the real danger is this immigrant or this refugee or this person of color. Uh, I'm so, and and, and it, this, this lie serves to help, help perpetuate the myth 
that uh, you know the elites uh, who are basically white people are somehow far removed from these things. In the committed, I make a very deliberate, it's a very deliberate part of the plot to point out that the French financed their empire in Indochina by basically becoming a drug running monopoly. So the original drug runners globally were the French and the British colonizers. I mean, this is part of the history of colonization. The French and the British went into, went, went into these countries that they occupied and basically forced the locals to buy drugs through state-run uh, opium monopolies. And in the French case, what the French did was they used their, um, their, uh, their, their government in Laos to, to grow opium, to have the, the Hmong people grow opium and then use that opium to sell to other Indo-Chinese people. And the French government and the military was doing this. And when the Americans came in, the Americans took over. I mean, literally the Americans came in and the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, just picked up where the French left off and took over the drug trade and helped to finance the secret war in Laos through the drug trade uh, with the Hmong. And that drug trade would then circulate through the rest of the for of former Indochina, uh, which would lead to like terrible consequences for, the, for, the, for Americans because then a lot of American soldiers got addicted to these drugs and then brought the drug trade back to the United States. So that's all a part of the history of the novel because in fact, the CIA does reappear in the committed and one of the major gangsters in the novel, the, uh, Ron the Ronin, that's, that's his name, right? <laughs> it's been a while since I've written, written this novel. The Ronin is, a, is a, uh, a, a Corsican gangster who was born in Vietnam and became a part of the drug trade and the French uh, you know, military. And then of course he comes to France along with the boss and they build their little empire. And a lot of that is based on, on reality that there, are, there were Corsican gangsters in, in Vietnam. There was a drug trade in Vietnam that, would, that uh, regardless of what my French uh, Vietnamese contact said was brought to Paris, this, uh, a very infamous figure of a Vietnamese gangster um, who, who, was, who was so successful that he was actually a, you know, a political threat in the 1950s in, Fran in Vietnam, Vietnam and was sent into exile in Paris where it was rumored that he walked his leopard up and down the Champs-Élysées. I've never, I've not found any confirmation that this actually happened, but that, that was part of the rumor that parts that, that helped to inspire the figure of the boss in the novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in journalism, that would be called a fact, a fact too good to check, no? <laughs> Um, okay, we have so many questions. I mean, there's so much to say, but I want to get to everyone's questions. So Giacomo, who's a PhD student tuning in from Italy, uh, PhD student uh, specifically studying Vietnamese American literature, asks you a question regarding the short story War Years from the Refugees, your short story collection. Uh, he writes, towards the end of the short story, the narrator muses, while some people are haunted by the dead, others are haunted by the living. I always loved this line, and I was wondering if Dr. Nguyen could elaborate on that. Thank you. Um, it's a lovely I'm line. It is, a, it is a lovely line. I'm glad to know that Giacomo is working on Vietnamese American literature in Italy, which is fantastic. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a Vietnamese refugee community in California in the 1970s and 1980s. And, uh, you know, the idea of being haunted, I think, was... Uh, for me, something that I felt, not that I would put it in that language, um, but I felt that uh, you know, ghosts were a real, real presence in the Vietnamese community because Vietnamese people do believe in ghosts, both bad ghosts and good ghosts. Um, and that, that I've heard stories you know, that people believed that their, their, their dead relatives had come back to you know, say goodbye to them. Um, and that this was not seen as something that was terrible. It was actually seen as something positive to have your, the ghost of your, your relative come and visit. Uh, so that's at the level of story and, and culture in which we find the importance of, of being haunted by the dead. But it seemed to me that, 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 that it was possible that, 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 that the refugees were also haunted by the living as well. I had that experience because you know, when we fled from Vietnam, uh, my parents left behind my adopted sister, who was the oldest sibling in the family. And so in 1980, uh, she sent us a picture, a black and white picture of herself. And by then she was about, I think, 20 years old. And so I, in the 80s, I grew up in this house in San Jose 
with this picture, you know, and I remember being very haunted by this picture because at that young age, you know, being 10 or 12, I, I felt, wow, I have a sister. I had no idea. I have no memory of this person. Why is she there? Why am I here? What if something else had happened and, and I had stayed behind and so on? And I think this is a very common experience for, for refugees of any kind, right? You, I think refugees are, are I, I don't know, this term has rarely been applied, but I think they, a lot of refugees feel survivor's guilt. How did, they, how did we survive? How did we make the journey and get here? And, and everybody else was left behind or they died during the war or they died in the crossing. Um, and what if my life had been had taken a different turn? And so we're haunted by the dead, but also by the living, by everybody who, who was left behind, right? And so when I was growing up, every time I would visit a Vietnamese house, there would always be a collection of black and white photographs uh, in, in, on display somewhere in the, in the house of the people who had been uh, left behind. Um, and, you know, I, I grew up in a house where basically two of my grandparents died in Vietnam uh, while we were in the United States. And I was really too young to understand what was happening because I'd never met them. Uh, or maybe I met one of my grandmothers, but I have no memory. And of course the occasion of these grandparents dying was obviously a big issue in my, in my house, but I didn't understand. Um, and so I think I emotionally understood that my parents were haunted by the living. Again, for example, my father, um, you know, he left North Vietnam in 1954. He was the only one from his family to leave. He and my mother grew up in the same village. And so he, they got married and then her, fa her entire family in 1954, when the country was divided into North and South, her entire family went South. My father went with them, but he left behind everybody else in his family who decided not to go. Um, and that meant that my, my father was the eldest brother in a family of three other brothers and a sister. He would not go back to that village until 1994 or so, which means he did not see his family for 40 years. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, and I remember growing up and seeing a picture in our household on the bookshelf of my father with his brothers as adults. And it took me a while. I don't know how long it took me to realize that this could not have possibly happened. He hadn't seen them since they were in Vietnam as kids. Uh, and I looked closer and I realized what he had done was he had taken a photo of the three of his adult brothers and then he had taken a photo of himself and he had spliced them together. And I saw the line in the photo where he had done that. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, this, this is so you know, emotionally meaningful that he did that. And I, 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 I wish I had taken a picture. I wish I had kept that frame because it disappeared. And then, you know, I finally, you know, my, brother, my dad is, is getting older. I've been asking him about the past and it's too late in a lot of ways because now he's hard of hearing. He won't wear his hearing aids. Either he says he doesn't hear me or he'll pretend not to hear me or, or he forgets or he'll pretend he forgets. I have no idea. But I said, do you remember this photo? Do you remember what you did to this? And he says, no. I'm like, okay, is it a figment of my imagination? Cause I can't find it anymore. But anyway, in, other, in, in short, this is how people are haunted by the living, you know, by, by these other lives, by the people who've been left behind, by the loss, not, not necessarily of lives, literally, not, not, not people actually dying, but think about it, the loss of actual lives. This is another life my father could have led if he had been with, in, with his family, you know, but he, he lost 40 years. Of, of time with that family or my sister, uh, you know, in Vietnam, forever separated from this family that had adopted her. Um, my brother said, you know, there was a rumor once, <laughs> I don't know how this started. Somebody said to me, oh, you're adopted. That's what the community is saying. I'm like, oh, really? I'm adopted? So I went home and told my dad and he got so upset. And my brother said, do you know, do you know, do you know how you're not adopted? And I said, how? And he said, well, because you didn't get left behind. I mean, think about that. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure my adopted sister has, has thought about that plenty in her in her life, right? But I've been haunted by the by those other lives that um, could have been led by my family. Yeah, I'm just going to read the line again. So it's from the short story War Years from the collection The Refugees. So you write, while some are haunted by the dead, others are haunted by the living. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the time and we really only have time for kind of one more question. Um, and so I wanted to ask Suzanne's question because it kind of represents questions that a lot of people are asking, which is what are you working on now? So you've been promoting your book virtually 
um, you were saying before the call. Um, but I imagine, you know, you've already kind of turned to a new project. So, so what are you thinking about? What are you writing and what are you working on? Uh, well, I'm writing a nonfiction book that talks about a lot of things we just talked about. Um, it's, it's a memoir, but it also incorporates a lot of discussion about politics and culture and all that and deals with my growing up in the United States and um, my thoughts about, about all these issues, about being a refugee, um, about American culture, about Vietnamese culture, and so on. So I never thought I would write a memoir. Um, and uh, mostly because I thought I had led a very boring life and that my parents had led a very interesting life. But in fact, I think um, every, every story is important. And I've, you know, I've learned this over and over again, listening to people's stories. A lot of us think our lives are unimportant, especially in comparison to whatever's happening on Instagram or you know, you know, Donald Trump, whatever. But in fact, uh, I think what, what artists demonstrate over and over again is that every individual life is worth remembering and and telling stories about. And it's really just how we tell those stories that really matter. So I did an interview with um, Isaac Lee Chung. He's a director. I don't know if, how many of you have heard of or seen his film Minari, which is a big deal here in the United States. And so, you know, Minari is about a Korean immigrant family in the United States who moved to um, uh, Arkansas, which is a very rural state. and tried to start a farm and live, pursue the American dream that way. And that was basically Lee Isaac Chung's life. And he said, you know, you know, he's my age. And he said, you know, he made a couple other films before and he finally made this film, but he said, you know, he, he thought who would want to hear this story about this family, who cares? And in fact, he produced a very beautiful film out of it because it came deeply from within himself and his family's experience. And so, you know, whether or not we become storytellers, the issue is every life. <laughs> Every life is worth um, telling a story about, and so that's what's happening there. And then after that, which and I, I hope can, I, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. So, are you approaching that process? How how are you finding yourself approaching that process differently? Um, as opposed to your fiction. I just spilled some tea. So hold on one sec. Oh no! Uh, I, I, think, I think this is this really is live. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is not um, recorded. I I think that. Um, so okay, here's what's interesting. You know, I, I actually re have have kept some archives of uh, of my writing and stuff when I was growing up and, and when I was in college, um, and that includes a journal, a really horrible journal that I was not very good at keeping. So there's, there's not that many entries and so on. But I was writing this in high school, and in my early years in college, and so I, I kept them. You know, and knowing that I never wanted to read these these memories because whenever I opened them and read them, I thought, oh my God, I'm just a horrible human being. You know, who can you get what's an example? <laughs> no, I don't want to give you an example. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's in the it's in the memoir. But but the, but basically the point is I went back and and I looked at uh, what I'd written and I realized number one, I had remembered some things. I remembered that I felt that I was a horrible human being. But then I had recorded things that I had totally forgotten about or distorted in my memory. Um, so I'll give you a hint. You know, my my mother uh, had um, you know she's a very heroic woman. She uh, you know had very little education, and she became a very successful business person. You know, she basically you know lifted herself up by herself with my father to become really wealthy people. And my mother was also someone who was afflicted with mental illness and ended up in the hospital a few times. That was obviously very traumatic for me, you know, growing up. And I, so I write about this and I write about how I thought that one of her hospital, hospitalizations happened when I was a kid. And then I go back and I read my journal and the paper that I, and, the, and, and I actually wrote an entire nonfiction piece for this in my college writing class. And I realized it happened in college, you know, and I had recorded it. And somehow though, even though I was there as like an 18, 19 year old person, as an adult, basically, somehow my mind had totally changed the circumstances that in looking back, I thought, oh, this happened when I was like 12. How does that happen? You know, and so the memoir delves in, into this, uh, this th these distortions that memory plays on us. 
um, that can, we can fool ourselves. Uh, and I was lucky that I had maintained a record of this so that actually, you know, it was very, there, you know, there's not much in the journal, but there's a very detailed account of, of me going to see my mother in the hospital, who the people that were there, the things that were being said. And I was like, there's a moment where I go into the bathroom and I just break down. I have no memory of this, right? But it's, it's recorded here. And so the memoir, memoir deals with it. And basically what the, the impetus for all this is something that in fact, you know, my college writing teachers told me, which is, you know, in order to write anything meaningful, you have to cut to the bone. And when I was 18 or 19, I was like, what does that mean? How do you cut to the bone? You know, but in fact, that's what writing has to do. And the thing that writing programs and writing teachers cannot teach you is how to do that. They can teach you possibly how to, you know, technically, can, you know, build a story and all the, all the various kinds of craft and technical issues and so on. No one can teach you how to look into your own soul, into your memory, into your feelings, things like this. And that is actually one of the most important things that a writer has to do because, you know, in, in these two novels, The Sympathizer and The Committed, I have not lived the events of the novels for the most part. Um, so I have to make stuff up. And so part of the energy of the novels comes from the plot, but hopefully the other part of the energy of the novels comes from the emotions. And where do the emotions come from? The writer has to imagine them or, and or feel them and, and extract them from within himself, herself, and so on. And so the memoir is partly about that. It's partly about confronting these emotions and these feelings that I much rather would have forgotten. And I think most sane people would. I mean, if terrible things happen to people, you know, a, a lot of people would rather just forget about them or distort them or change them in order to be able to deal with them in a certain way. But I don't think a writer has that luxury. A writer has to go there, has to uncover these things, uh, to be honest. Um, and so that's what the memoir ultimately is about. Okay, so after, <laughs> after that, uh, I have to uh, um, write the third installment of the Sympathizer trilogy. So in what do you fact, mean? What do you mean you have to? I have to? I have, I have, <laughs> I have to? Uh, I, I have to because I feel like, you know, um, that the, uh, one, I, think, I think one of the things that makes writing worthwhile for, for anybody is the writer's capacity to be, to be honest and uh, whether it's honest about emotions or honest about politics and so on. And um, uh, the, the question is how much honesty is required. And I don't think, you know, the memoir, for example, is not an exhaustive memoir. It's not like the, 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 the infamous biography of Philip Roth out there right now where it's like, I have it, it's like 900 pages long. No, 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 this, this book is gonna be like a couple hundred pages. So I don't get into exhaustive details about my life, but honest in the sense of trying to get to the emotional core of things. Um, so that's what we expect when we turn to writers, right? I mean, that they be emotionally honest, that they be honest about the culture and the politics that they deal with, uh, or if not honest, have a capacity for, for deep analysis. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I put books down partly when I feel like there's not enough honesty or analysis rigor happening. It's not a scholarly kind of rigor, it's a rigor about being able to look at something and, and peel back the layers and show what's happening in a society or in a, in a person's um, life or psyche. So that's theoretically what will happen in the memoir. We'll see. <laughs>